Welcome back to the Victorian Alliance 47th Annual House Tour. I'm Bonnie Spindler, your host. So a lot of homeowners will tell you, it's very common, that they say that the house doesn't really belong to them. It belongs to all the people that came before them and all the people that came after them. They're a caretaker, a steward. So part of the fun of living in these homes is imagining the people who lived here before, doing histories, digging up clues. Let's take a look. The house was built by Asa and Lydia Fisk, who were natives of Boston. They came here wealthy, which is unusual. So much of the wealth in San Francisco was self-made while you were here. When they built the house and moved in in 1884, they had two children, uh, young, they were 12, 13, 14, daughter and son. And they lived in the house until the children went to school. We have pictures of the family from the de descendants showing the children and grandchildren living in this house. It's such a happy feeling. You can see the sunlight in the windows. And each family has stayed here uh, almost a full generation, 30, 35 years, as, and sometimes two generations. The Macklemores, who came here in the late 40s, early 50s, they bought the house in 1953, had as many as 15 family members living here at the house, two sets of children from two different wives. And the stories that I've heard from the, from the daughter who lived here was watching the children slide down the banister as mom held paper bag lunches and handed them off as they went out the front door to school, most likely to the John Muir Elementary School up the street. So it's, it's always been filled with happiness and joy. The, we bought it from Donald and Lily Chan, who raised their three daughters here. My son went to high school with the youngest daughter, who became an actor. And they talk about it with incredible love and uh, joy as they talk about the, the protective presence of this house. Lily Chan was very protective of the house, so was Donald. And as, as we were in the negotiating process of buying the house, one of the things that she wanted to know is that we would really care for it. So we invited her to our house in Forest Hill, which was a completely different style home. And Jim had done his designer magic with my home and had really, con that convinced her that we were prepared to take on this house and keep it a family home. So usually when you think of history and the person who built your house, it's kind of a mystery. Uh, you know, you know their name maybe or their occupation, but that's usually it. And we feel really lucky because we were able to know a lot more than we thought we would when we first bought this house uh, because we found something. And in the basement of this house when we were doing a seismic retrofit, we found the original diary of the man who built this house in 1910. He was the carpenter who built the room that I'm sitting in right now. Uh, and here it is. Uh, and it's a really good read. Um, you know, you uh, might expect it to be something like uh, he traveled to America, what it was like leaving Denmark, but actually it's all a love story. Uh, and his sole motivation for coming to America was really the love of his life, a woman named Anna. And it's all written right in the book uh, in Danish. So this is one of my favorite entries from the diary. And it tells a story about how Hans Hansen first saw uh, the love of his life, Anna. And it's from April 10, 1900. The old memories come back to me and I think back to the first time I saw my friend Anna. I was 14 years old and I was tending cows at Christopher, ne Christopher Nielsen's farm in Husby in Denmark. And on a Saturday afternoon, I left the field and went to the new houses to be with the other boys. Just my luck, Anna was visiting there and I saw my friend for the first time. And in my quiet mind, I imagined then that we'd be, we would be engaged. That was my first thought, but how could I do that because she is a lovely girl and I have no money. So we're looking at a mural in a San Francisco residence. These types of historic murals are both 
common and somewhat uncommon. We do know from the historical record and from looking at residences that still exist today that um, a number of architects and early uh, property developers in San Francisco worked with local artisans to create murals in residential properties. The, the main three points we want to put across to anybody in this position is conservation, preservation, then potentially restoration. So we can see in this small little square here, it's a brighter yellow than the rest of the composition pigments around it. So this is dirty and grimy, and this is what we can see if we cleaned the painting, it's going to be much brighter and cleaner. After cleaning, we would put a UV protective barrier layer and varnish over the entire surface to protect it from color losses in the future from just daylight coming through the windows. Um, if we have other areas of loss in any mural where we need to in-paint, we'd use watercolors to match the original pigments after cleaning and then again put another UV protective layer over the surface to prevent color loss, bleaching, and fading. The house was originally built by uh, a German Jewish immigrant family. Uh, the last name was Westerfeld. William Westerfeld and his wife Pauline were the original owners. They had the house constructed at a cost of $9,985 and it was completed in March of 1889. They lived here with their four children uh, until 1895 where there was a very untimely passing of Mr. Westerfeld. Now, I was very blessed to have uh, known uh, his granddaughter. She was a native San Franciscan named uh, Juanita Westerfeld Benson. She grew up on Pine Street in the house that she was born and raised in, and she lived a long life into her 80s. Um, I had about a 15-year friendship with her from the time I bought the house until her passing, and uh, she filled me in completely on history of the house and her family's history. She, when she passed away, she left me photographs of her uh, family so that I could share um, the family's wealth of knowledge with, and what they have done for San Francisco with everybody. After the Russians had left the house uh, in the late 1940s, the house was divided into a 14-unit apartment building. It attracted a large number of African-American jazz musicians as Fillmore Street was the Harlem of the West. They used the ballroom downstairs uh, for nightly jam sessions, and some very famous people lived here in the time. Uh, Hugh Masekela, Art Lewis, and John Handy all lived in the house at times and they would bring all very famous people over from Fillmore Street Jazz Clubs to play here in the house late at night. That brought in, in the late 1950s, a group of beatniks that started moving into the rooms because they liked the jazz scene here. By the early 1960s, the beatnik era had evolved into the birth of the Haight-Ashbury and the hippie movement. This home became the first commune in the city for a commune called the Calliope Company, in which Ken Kesey uh, was a member of. They moved out in 1966 and the house became taken over by a famous underground filmmaker, Kenneth Anger, who was also a practicing Satan worshiper. He conducted uh, rituals here with Anton LaVey, head of the Church of Satan, who did bring his baby lion to the house. We have photographs of the lion in the house. And uh, they also attracted members of the Manson family. We were actually in the former bedroom of Bobby Beausoleil, the first Manson member arrested for murder um, in uh, 1969. I also uh, grew up in the Haight-Ashbury as a young kid and I was exposed to the hippie uh, scene at a very early age. I collected a lot of the memorabilia for it uh, because it was very exciting and intriguing for me. It, it also touched my heart as much as Victorians did. So today I have a room up in the house of uh, artifacts I collected in the Haight-Ashbury during the Summer of Love of 1967. And uh, I left one room of this house as it might have looked in the 1960s when this was a hippie commune with 50 hippies living in it. Well, I've admired this house since I was a teenager, and this was a very bad neighborhood at the time, kind of dangerous to even come into the neighborhood. Uh, but I would venture here and take photographs of the house, and it was on my mind that I wanted to buy a Victorian mansion. At the time, I didn't have any money. I was 19, 20 years old, so I started buying property so that I could afford to buy a Victorian mansion with this house, very house in mind. 
1986, there, this house was up for sale. It was listed at over a million dollars. I knew I could never afford that. I happened to be driving by the house one day and the former owners were having a garage sale. So we stopped the car. I got in, I got out of the car, walked through the house and fell in love with it. And I told her how I'd loved uh, this house since I was a kid and I liked the Adams family. And they also liked the Adams family. They said, why don't you buy it? Well, I could never afford a million dollars. And they said, well, what could you afford? So we sat down in the back parlor and figured out, uh, at that time I owned several other uh, properties in the city, and we figured out that if I did list all those for sale, I could afford to buy this one, and that is exactly what I did. I listed uh, all of the other properties I owned in San Francisco at the time, and I uh, ended up buying this house in 1986 at a cost of $750,000. Preservation allows us to remember things that might otherwise be lost. The Victorian Alliance has known that for over a generation. Since 1973, we have worked to keep San Francisco from tearing down whole neighborhoods of Victorians. Please join us next time when we'll be talking about efforts big and small to restore our houses. We're hoping to inspire you to either join the Victorian Alliance, to give to our grants programs, or to start a community program of your own.